Come on in, everyone. Anybody have any questions before we get started? Got a little bit of time left before we start. Got three minutes, anyways. No questions, anything past or future, anything like that? Um, so this weekend, you said the practice test will be going up? Yeah, I've, uh, I've got it set up now. I just got to post it. I'll probably post it either tonight or first thing in the morning. And what I'm leaning towards doing is I'll probably leave it up until the 31st at 11.59. And then at like 12.01, uh test one will come open and you'll have until the sunday thereafter to uh complete that uh and like i said i normally give you usually three opportunities and i only take the highest score of course if you're happy with the first score then you can keep that and that'll be fine but i do give you up to three attempts usually on the test yeah on the online tests oh wow and you're allowed open book open notes and you're allowed to do google searches Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, but and they then, only count like 10% of the course. So it's, it's, it's me trying to get you to solve a lot of problems so that you can do better for the midterm and, and the final, which are proctored. Okay. Um, I do have a question about the proctoring on the, uh, on the midterm. Mm -hmm. um, as far as, so like I've had some classes where like they set up the lockdown browser so that you like can't have anything else in the room. Like I'm in an office that also has another computer in it right like my partner's computer is behind me so like i don't know like would that be an issue like if no they, no it, I, that's fine because i use i as long as you've got a document cam or webcam not a document cam but a webcam uh i use the respondus lockdown browser along with respondus monitor so it watches you as well and uh, yeah got real-time staff that look at it and i can look at it anytime i want so what I normally do is as long as your computer can run both lo Respondus Lockdown Browser and you have a webcam that allow you to run the re Respondus Monitor, then you don't have to come in for testing. Otherwise, you, you'd either find a testing center or come into campus and get tested. Okay. So I've, I've had it where professors have set up Respondus so that you needed to like give the webcam a tour of the entire room. There couldn't be any windows in the room and like all sorts of stuff like that. And it's yeah, been a half bad. in the past. I do ask them to take the webcam and show your working area, like down below your feet, what your station is. Uh, you're allowed an equation seat. So any blank sheets or equation sheets, you got to show me one by one. Uh, you got to hold up your ID next to your face, photo ID, so I can see that it's you. Uh, and then I, I just ask you guys to be very careful. I don't want to see a lot of work like this because that, you know, obviously is something that's going to draw a red flag. So try to keep your work on top of the table. Uh, if you ever get in a spot where you are working down like that, just to direct the, the webcam work and see your face and your paper that you're working and that'll be fine too. So okay. I haven't, I haven't, so far I haven't had any problems. All the students look like they've been doing okay. And, you, you can sort of tell uh, whether it's working or not because the online tests have averages 96, 97, 98, and then the midterm and the final are like an average of like 62 or 58 or something like that. And I don't like that, uh, but I warn you guys that way so y'all can hopefully figure out, hey, I got to learn how to learn as opposed to how to look up stuff. And the more problems you work, the better off you'll be at that. So when is uh, uh, when you opening the first test? Uh, the first test, I will probably open it up on the, is, is probably the morning of February 2nd. I think that's a Wednesday. It'll be opened up at like 12.01 a.m. And then you'll have until Sunday at 11.59 p.m. to do it. I always give you a whole weekend. Uh, sometimes I give you a whole week. And the next test will probably come quicker than you expect because we got so delayed on this one. You'll also notice, please, everybody, uh, check your my lab and mastering dates because I took chapters one, two, and three and readjusted the dates so you have more time because we did get a little bit behind. Uh, I'll send you a, a, a announcement out when I put the practice test up 
And when I put the, the actual test up, I'll send out another announcement. But I always give you at least a weekend to do the test. And I, I try to give you at least uh, you know five or six days with the practice test. The big thing is the practice test disappears. So if you don't uh, if you don't take the practice test a bunch of times before the test uh, comes online, you're kind of toast. Uh, the whole purpose of the practice test is to help you do well in the test. So if you uh, if you don't take it, then you're sort of shooting yourself in the foot. I, I highly recommend, like, as soon as you finish reading chapter one and two and doing the homework for chapter one and two, the rest of your time, at least regarding chapters one and two, should just be done by doing practice tests. Because those practice tests, I guarantee. 80% of the points on your actual test will come from questions that you had the chance to see in the practice test. Because every time you take it, it'll be a different set of questions. And you're Professor, using short. Is, when did you say the practice tests are gonna be opened up? I'll send you an announcement when it does, but it'll probably be tonight or tomorrow. Okay, cool, thank you. No problem. Anybody else have anything? All right, so uh, I didn't necessarily show you, quote unquote, all of the kinematic equations. I basically derived the kinematic equations for you, starting from, you know, uh, A being a constant and setting that equal to dV dt. Integrated that, I ended up getting V equals V0 plus AT. That is one of the kinematic equations. That's only true if you use the average acceleration or it's only true if the acceleration is a constant. Then having V equals V0 plus AT, I set that equal to DX DT and integrated that and I got X equals one half AT squared plus V0 T plus X0. And that's another one of the kinematic equations, which obviously is true for a constant acceleration situation, not in all situations. But then I took that first equation, that V equals V0 plus AT. I solved that for time and stuck it in the X equals one half AT squared equation and got that third kinematic equation, which was V squared equals V0 squared plus two times A times parentheses X minus X0. Uh, I know most of you don't see equations like that in your head and it probably, you know, throwing you for a loop, but I'm just trying to uh, you know, jog your memory about what equations we're uh, using. There's another equation that comes in really handy, and it's the average velocity if and only if the acceleration is constant. The average velocity is the initial velocity plus the final velocity, and that's for any time interval. So it don't have to be the velocity at t equals zero. It could be the velocity at one second and the velocity at 8.4 seconds. If you add those two and divide by two, you'll get the average velocity assuming the acceleration is constant. So that's another uh, kinematic equation. Another one which should make some sense to you is that the distance traveled X is equal to, or your final position, if you want to call it final position instead of the distance traveled, the final position is equal to your initial position plus your average velocity times time. That's That comes in handy. That's part of the stuff I've been telling you about. You know, if I drive a trip to Daytona Beach or something and I know my average velocity over that, I can just take that, uh, uh, look up the miles to the resort that I want to go to, divide that by that average miles per hour, and that'll give me a good estimate of how long it takes. Those are just some of the equations that we use and any of them that are numbered in the chapter you're allowed to use. So if you look in a chapter and it has like an equation and next to it, there's a parenthesis that says 2.34a close parenthesis, that means that's a numbered equation and you're allowed to have it on your equation sheet. So keep that in mind. I, uh, I have several videos in the queue that are still waiting to go up. Uh, please, I recommend you guys, even if you just do it, I mean, I'm not making any money off this, so, but if you just take the time to do it while you're in my class, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. And every time I put a new video up, it'll let you know that uh, by a text message or something like that. And usually when I've seen it, 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 I can see enough of the title to tell whether it's relevant to 241 or 242. So I definitely recommend you doing that. 
uh, I'm, I've got a lot of problems I'm working for you. Some of them are ones that uh, are just a little bit stronger than what the, you know, the book does sort of the bare minimum. It might work one or two hard ones, but the rest of them are pretty straightforward. So you need to see some experience or have some experience seeing some of the more difficult ones. And that's, uh, that's sort of what I do uh, with my online YouTube channel. So keep an eye on that. Does anyone have any questions on anything else while we're here? Okay, well, I worked a problem today in class, and uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm just laughing. One of the students asked me where those numbers came from, and I, I made a joke. It was it was it was class A, man. It was definitely definitely a good joke. <laughs> but anyways, uh, I made up a problem today, and it was a really good one because often what happens in a calculus based physics course, uh, especially at places where you don't necessarily get uh, the uh, a bunch of strong students. You might get a lot of really hardworking students, but they don't have a lot of background. Uh, the only calculus they'll do in chapters one and two is they'll give you like V is equal to you know, 3T squared plus 4T. What's the acceleration? Which means you're going to take a derivative. Uh, we, we want more than that from you guys in a calculus-based physics class. So I'm going to show you uh, just like I did in deriving the kinematic equations, I'm now going to derive a, kinem a set of kinematic equations that work specifically when the acceleration is not a constant. So I wanted to work one like that. And while we're doing it, you can learn a little bit about differential equations, about how math works, all that cool stuff. So uh, let me start off by making sure my iPad is on. I accidentally left my iPad on overnight and it was down to like 20%. And I've got one of those stupid USB-C ports, and I literally have exactly one plug to plug that in. So now I've got an extension cord with a power strip. I got a, a metal rod with a hook on it hanging onto the corner of my desk to keep the power strip from falling off. It definitely looks like a, a, a Rube Goldberg sort of device I got going here. But anyways, let me do share screen, iPad. Like that. Feel free to feel free to stop me and ask any questions as you go, or as I go. It's okay if uh, if you if you pull me off of my rhythm, it's not a big deal. I can catch back up. So, all right, now it's telling me I can share. It did share. That's great. Again, there's my YouTube channel in case anybody misses it. www.youtube.com slash Billy Younger Physics Solution. Notice the B, the Y, the P, and the first S in solutions is actually capitalized. So here's a problem. Let's imagine that acceleration is not a constant. Imagine a scenario in which acceleration is actually equal to 4.00, and I want to make the units right. It's going to be meters per second per second squared times T plus, let's say 3.00, do I want that? Oh yeah, that'll be good. Uh, that unit will be of course meters per second every second, okay? Now, if you were to take into account the fact that A, is equal to dv dt, that would probably suggest to you, hey, I'm going to integrate that. But if you integrated that without a range of integration, in other words, you didn't have a limit or a number at the bottom edge of the integral and the top edge of the integral, what would you have to do? Does anybody remember what you do? Can you ask that question one more time? Yeah, uh, if you're given an integral like y uh, or like the integral of x squared dx, just like that, you have to integrate the integral integral of x squared dx. What do you get? X third over three. Anything else you want to add to that? Let's see. Yeah, plus the integration constant. Right. That's that's the big deal, and that's sort of something that you want to see. Uh, it turns out, just like when you were studying polynomials, if you had linear equations like 3x plus 4 equals 2, there was one solution. 
if you had quadratic equations like 3x squared plus 9x minus 4 equals 0, there was two solutions. If you had a third order polynomial, there's three, so on and so forth. Well, the same thing happens here. If you have to integrate once, you're going to have one constant of integration. And the way you can deal with that is have one initial condition. So that's in, in the words of a differential equation class, you need one differential equation for each, or excuse me, one initial condition for each level of differential equation you have. So right now, if you set A equal to DVDT, that's just a single order derivative. So you're going to need one initial condition. And that initial condition is going to be that the velocity at t equals zero will be equal to, or excuse me, I, I wrote that a little funny. Let me fix that a little bit. The velocity, well, I wrote it real funny, but I erased it. The velocity at t equals zero is equal to, let's say, uh, negative 1.00 meters per second. So that's an initial condition. It doesn't actually have to be at t equals zero. Just often that's the easiest way to express it. I could have given you the velocity at four seconds, and you could do that as well. But that's just like getting rid of the integration constant. Uh, but after that, we'll get a voltage as a function of time, and then we'll make use of the fact that voltage is equal to dx dt, which would, in fact, introduce another constant of integration. So in that case, what I'm going to say is x at t equals 0 is going to be positive 15.0 meters. OK, so those are my initial conditions. All right. So now what I'm going to do is actually address this. This is an acceleration that's linear in time. That's not necessarily a realistic uh, acceleration because literally this this acceleration is suggesting that it's going to get better at accelerating the longer you travel so that's not very realistic the normal scenario would be like initially the acceleration is but ugly high and then it levels off as you go up for instance if you look at the uh tesla uh plaid i think it's called the tesla s plaid that has a zero to 60, check this out, in 1.9 seconds. Zero to 60 in 1.9 seconds. That's pretty bad, okay? But that acceleration, if you actually look at acceleration versus time curve there, that acceleration goes shoots up really high and then starts to level off. So acceleration not being a constant is way more normal uh, than acceleration being a constant. And acceleration being linear is crazy, but either way, I just need you guys to know how to deal with such a thing. So let's start off. I'm going to take that acceleration as a function of time and I'm going to write it. I'm going to drop the units. I know all the units work right now uh, because uh, if you multiply meters per second per second squared times seconds, you get meters per second per second, which is the acceleration unit. And that's the same thing with the S. So I'm just going to leave the units away right now and I'm going to say 4.00 t plus 3.00 is equal to dv dt. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides by dt. Remember, whatever you do to one side of equation, as long as you do the same thing to the other side, you're generally okay. There is a caveat to that, of course, and that caveat is that uh, you're you're not allowed to multiply through by zero or to divide, to divide by th uh, through by zero. Uh, you don't, no one would ever do that intentionally, but a lot of math tricks that you run into in, in neat little puzzle books essentially have you do something crazy like that, not knowingly, and then you end up proving that, you know, eight equals 12 or something weird. So that's almost always the way that works. So I just multiplied by DT. Now I'm going to take the integral of both sides. And as you can see, I'm integrating with respect to time here. So my range of integration for this part is going to be from t equals zero to any time t period. So uh, students had a little bit of problem with that earlier when I was talking to them. But that integration to t means 
I'm allowing this to go to any time T. That T stands for four seconds if you want it to be four seconds. That T stands for 892 seconds if you want it to be 892 seconds. Similarly, I'm going to integrate the right-hand side. And if you notice, it looks like the DTs cancel out. And they sort of do if you've ever seen the chain rule, for instance. So I'm really just integrating DV. Uh, or if you look at the fundamental theorem of calculus, it basically says for some reason... That crazy thing that Newton discovered in how to find the slope of a tangent line, that thing is oddly enough related to that crazy thing Newton discovered in finding the area under a curve in such a way that they're just opposite operations. It's just a freak of nature that it happened to be that way, but it is. So if you integrate a derivative, you get the argument of the derivative back. So I'm integrating from V... Now I could write this at t equals zero, or I could just write v of zero. That that's fine too. So this let the symbol I wrote up here in the in the left hand side, v with a subscript at t equals zero. That's the exact same thing as what I wrote at the bottom of that integral. Does everybody understand that? And that's just v of t there. Any questions on that? Okay, so I suspect this integral on the left is pretty easy. Anybody want to tell me what they think it is? Is it 2t squared plus 3t? Exactly. You're, you're basically going to take and take the exponent on the t, increase it by 1, and then divide by that. So that'll be t squared, and when you divide 4 by t, 2, you get 2. So yes, it's going to be, and notice, evaluating at t equals 0, both terms are going to have a t in it, so it's going to be 0. So this becomes 2.00 t squared plus 3.00 t. Now, what really happened there is I got that, and then I evaluated at t and got that answer. And then I evaluated at t equals zero and got minus zero. So that's what really happened. Uh, you don't have to show it, but that's it. Now, the right-hand side, anybody know what, what's going to happen there? Is it t? Yeah, it's going to be v of t minus the v of t equals zero, which is negative one. So I'm going to say minus negative 1.00. Uh, the units, of course, are meters per second, so I'll put them here for that split second, but really I'm not going to use the units again until later. So now I can write that the velocity as a function of time is equal to 2.00t squared plus 3.00t. Uh, this minus a minus is a plus, so when I pull it to the other side, it's going to become a minus 1.00, and notice that you, as units was meters per second, which is exactly the units of velocity, so that is as we expected, so all the units look like they're working right. So I now have, from just the acceleration as a function of time, I've actually found the velocity as a function of time. Any questions on that? So I'm not expecting you guys to have thought of this all on your own. I mean, if you had differential equations, maybe, or if you paid very close attention and your calculus teacher uh, was a little bit pedantic about covering the physics related stuff, I might think that you might be able to do it. But other than that, no, you're not expected to have come up with this on your own. What you are expected to be able to do is realize, oh, now I know how he does that. I can do that myself. Okay. Now I'm going to make use of V is equal to DX DT. So I'm going to write two point. Well, I don't know why I switched to red there uh, to blue there, but I should, probably should have. I like blue better, but I'm going to write 2.00 T squared plus 3.00 T minus 1.00 is actually equal to actually I need a bigger gap than that. So I'm going to say is actually equal to dx dt. Now, this is all one-dimensional motion. That's why I'm not using vector symbols and stuff like that. 
So just like I did before, I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by dt. And it seems like I still didn't give myself enough room. So that, all right. Now I'm going to integrate both sides and I'll get the integral from, and this left-hand side I'm integrating from t equals zero to any t later. I'm integrating 2.00 t squared plus 3.00 t minus 1.00 all that times dt. And that's all equal to the integral of dx dt dt. Now I'm really, if you look at the dt's are canceling out, so I'm integrating from x of t equals zero to x of t. Again, that x of t equals zero, I'm just referring to this quantity right here is x of zero, just like this quantity right here was v of zero. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so this problem I just realized is clearly different from the one I did in class because the numbers came out prettier in class. But either way, it's no big deal. I have to integrate the right-hand side and the left-hand side. Anybody want to take a poke at what the left-hand side is? Um, Something with two-thirds. Hold on, give me a second. <laughs> so you can call it two-thirds, that's fine. You don't need to do that arithmetic. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, you're exactly right. It's going to be zero point, whoops, get back to red. It's going to be zero point, I'm going to try to keep the same number of sig figs. So zero point six, 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 and I'll carry one extra by putting an underline on it, T cubed. The next one will be 1.50, because half of uh, three is 1.50 t squared minus 1.00 t is equal to x of t minus what we found uh, x of t equals zero to be was plus 15. So I'll write 15.0 meters right there and that's probably the last time i'll write the unit on it. okay so i can go ahead and solve for x of t and i get x of t is equal to 0 0.6667 t cubed plus 1.50 t squared wait professor sorry to interrupt you so no you put the X on the right hand side for like that 15. You subtracted it from the X of T for what reason? Uh, just because uh, I want X of T as a function because X of T is literally the function that tells me where the object will be at any point in time. Just like V of T is the function that will tell me what, what the velocity of the vehicle is. Okay. At any point in time. I see it now. I see. I see. OK, and yeah, I put it in the opposite order. I put the X on the left and the, the left hand side on the right, just just because I'm used to writing from left to right. OK, now I have minus 1.00 T. And of course, I'm going to pull the minus 15 to the other side. So that's going to be plus 15.0. So now what I have is actually a. basically an equation that gives me the path of travel of this object. So it's not that you can only deal with objects with constant acceleration. You can certainly deal with objects with non-constant acceleration. You just have to go through this process and find out what your equations will be if you're fortunate enough to have the acceleration as a function of time. So any questions on that? I have a question. Go for it. Uh, yeah, I don't understand where where came uh, the negative one and uh, 
the, so, the 15. Yeah. So if you look up here, I've just put green stars around them. This is exactly this is the question that was making me giggle before. So the student in my class said, uh, where did you get those numbers? And I pretended like I pulled it out my butt because that's really what I did. I just made them up. Okay. So, okay, so we go ahead. So we could have just integrated with uh, like C1 and C2 for the constant. Right. But if I give you initial conditions like I did here, then you can actually evaluate the C1 and the C2 constants. And that's what I did. Okay. So either I have to give you those two initial conditions, which I put a green star by, or you have to just leave it as a constant C1 and then another constant C2. All right. Good job. All right. So now I'm going to put the units back in just to remind you that it does work. So the unit in front of the T, uh, remember it's 4.0 meters per second per second squared. That's just going to be meters per second cubed. So I'm going to put that right in here and realize that's meters per second cubed, which by the way, time comes in units of seconds. And time is being squared. So if you multiply meters per second cubed times second squared, you just get meters per second, which is exactly the units for velocity. So you expected that. That worked out nicely. This is the kind of check you should do just to make sure you didn't make any careless mistakes. Similarly, if you uh, just write the units for the three, you'll see that's meters per second squared. So I'm going to put that there. That is meters per second squared and obviously if you multiply by time which comes in seconds that's going to make it meters per second again which again is a unit of velocity so we're feeling good about that and then finally the minus one that actually had units of meters per second so you see all of this v of t has the right units only the right units are being added together so that's all great and the same thing happens down here. I get meters per second cubed. I get meters per second squared. I get meters per second. And in this one, I just get plain meters. And of course, meters per second cubed times T cubed gives me just meters. Meters per second squared times T squared gives me just meters. And meters per second times T just gives me meters. And then 15 meters gives me meters. So I see all the units work. That's a wonderful thing to check. Uh, if you check it and you find that the units do not work, that can also, that can all uh, often lead you to figure out exactly what mistake you made and where, and it, you know, it could be the difference from getting a 98 on a test versus a, a 72. So any questions on that? All right, so you'll see when you start taking your practice test, there's several problems like this in the bank that I use for my practice test. And some of them will just say, find the velocity as a function of time, and they'll just give you the acceleration as a function, and they'll tell you that the velocity is four meters per second at t equals zero. So in that case, you're just sort of doing the first half where I got up to v of t. And sometimes I'll have a follow-up problem to that where you're going to find x of t, or sometimes I'll have a problem where you got to do both of those. So this is an ongoing problem. Uh, that we're expecting you to be able to do. And it really is the difference between the algebra-based physics course and the calculus-based physics course. So uh, I, again, I don't expect you to have come up with the ability to do this just on your own. If you did, that's awesome. But that's not what's expected of you. Like most things in physics, uh, what's expected of you is once you've seen someone do it, then you should be able to do it with a little bit of practice. So, you know, write down that acceleration, write down those two initial conditions, close your notebook, close the video that you're watching or whatever, and see if you can at least get up to the velocity. If you run into a spot where you don't know what to do next, go back, look at the video again, or look at the problem in your book, or look at your notes. 
and then close those and try it again. If you get stuck again, do it again. That's the way you learn. And a lot of it really is about that. It's, it's not, it feels really good to watch someone solve a problem and you feel like you're really learning a lot. And in some sense you are, but then when you have to put pen to paper, it's almost impossible to get problem solved and, unless you do it this way. So you, you, you should, as a bare minimum, have a mastery of the examples that the textbook has and then try to master the individual problems that I put up. And if you can do those, the ones on the actual practice tests and homework and uh, actual tests will be a lot easier. I normally give homework problems that are significantly more difficult than test problems. And that just hopefully over prepares you. So any questions on that, anybody? So this is the process that we are going to have to do on the test when it's not a constant acceleration. Exactly. If okay. they, so, go ahead. I'm sorry. So, how do we identify that it's not a constant acceleration? Uh, they would give you what if a, and in fact, I saw a problem like that. Let me let me give you a very specific example. I'm looking at the e-text right now, and uh, what they gave me in problem uh, in problem. Let's see. I saw it just a second ago. It was not that problem, not that problem. Looking for it, looking for it. So here's one instance where you're going the other way. In number 26 for chapter 22, it says a particle moves along the x-axis. Its position as a function of time is given by x equals 4.8 t plus 7.3 T squared, where T is measured in seconds. And they want you to find the acceleration. That's an obvious case where you're going to take the derivative to get the velocity, and then you're going to take the derivative again to get the acceleration. That's sort of the backwards for what we're doing. The one I'm looking for, though, I saw it. I know it's going to be, oh, uh, no, that's not it. Crap. Maybe it's further back instead of forward. I thought it was further back. Speed and velocity. Okay, so let me go a little further. It's really a nice little problem, and it's it's essentially the same problem that I just worked, except they didn't use numbers. They said the acceleration is equal to A T plus B or something got awful like that, and you just left the, the symbol A and the symbol capital B. So if you look at prob uh, problem, ah, here's one. Number 72 gives you V of T equals 25 plus 18 T. That's one case. Not the one I was looking for, by the way. So now, it sounds like the acceleration will be given in some type of equation. Yeah, you can be given the acceleration in equation form, and then you'd have to integrate it and then integrate it again. I can't even find a problem now. Why, where did it go? It just disappeared. It's, it's magic. <laughs> I'm actually looking through the general problems now and still don't see it. But anyways, there's definitely one in here. And I saw it written A is equal to capital A times T plus like capital B. And they asked you to do the same thing that I just did. I did it with actual numbers. So it was maybe a little less abstract. Maybe it wasn't. I'm not sure. Uh, but that was my goal. So if you look, and that's always a good thing to do when you're doing your online homeworks. I used to always run through and try to find the equivalent problem within the textbook because sometimes they'll either give you a hint or if it's an odd problem, you can work it until you get the right answer according to the back of the book. And then you know you've done it right. And then you can go back and solve the, the one in electronic format and get a good score. So that's another trick that often comes in handy because they always put the odd answers in the back of the book. Ah. Nope, dang, I thought that was it. Number 27 was was the one I think I, I think number 27 might have been the one I saw and confused for what I've been looking for. But anyways, yeah, they'll give you A as a function of T and then they'll ask you to find the velocity or they'll ask you to find the position as a, fu a function of time, all that kind of stuff. So, okay, thanks. sorry I couldn't find that for you, but I was hoping I could. Any other questions, anyone?
Okay, so so quickly, let's recap what we actually do have in terms of equations. Uh, that equation I just derived, for instance, was very much uh, not for constant acceleration. That was one for a linear acceleration. You can imagine the acceleration could be sinusoidal. It could be logarithmic. It could be exponential. It could be asymptotic, which is actually a very real situation, an asymptotic uh, acceleration. But you just continue to integrate uh, from A to get to V and then from V to get to X. Uh, but there's also other problems. So let me write down the kinematic equations that we know. So one of, one of the ones that I did not uh, mention to you guys until today is that X is equal to X zero plus V bar T. Now, if the velocity is constant, then you don't even need that bar over it. It's just always going to be true. Okay. As long as you have that bar over it, it's always going to be as true as well. So that one doesn't necessarily have to have a constant acceleration. So that's always true. Uh, another one we came up with was V is equal to V zero plus AT. Now, if the acceleration is a constant, that's absolutely true. If it's not, I just put a line over it. Uh, then it's only true as long as you use the constant. So for A equals a constant, we get V is equal to V zero plus AT, which is the same as that equation, except I don't have to do the average now. The next equation we got was uh, X is equal to one half AT squared plus V zero times t plus x zero and actually that's only true so i shouldn't even put it there it's only true for constant acceleration so let me erase it over there and i'll just put it right here okay now one thing i want you to notice about this conceptually is notice we have a one half at squared term and then we have a V0T term. That Those two terms not being intermingled. Notice there's no A times V0 and no A over V0 and no V0 over A. That is a really unique thing. And it's a fundamental concept in physics that guess what? Gravity acts on all things the same way. So a neat problem that we do in physics, and I used to do a physics demo, but then, you know, we started having a lot of mass shootings, so we had to change the wording. So what we had was a shoot Barney demonstration, and we set up a pole on the end of it, I mean, on a big table, and the pole would probably be about eight feet high, and we'd have Barney, who had a little magnet stuck to his head. Uh, he would hang from this magnet, and then we had a laser-sighted projectile gun which is the same projectile motion thing you'll use in your lab this semester but it had a light sensor on the front of it so the instant the ball came out of the barrel that light sensor would turn off the electromagnet and barney would fall so we treated this like the monkey in the tree problem because if you're trying to let's say humanely uh tranquilize a monkey so that you can give it say uh, uh, vaccinations or some medicine to make it healthy or something, you know, if a, a monkey's hanging from a tree, the instant he hears that gun and the speed of sound is likely faster than a tranquilizer gun. So the instant he hears that sound, he's probably going to let go of the tree limb and just fall. Right. So do you aim the gun above the monkey? Do you aim the gun directly at the monkey or do you aim the gun slightly below the monkey to make sure you hit the monkey anybody and, and everybody gets it wrong directly so at it. was that directly at it yes you do aim it directly at it well here's the weird thing even though you're shooting upward gravity acts on the monkey and the and the dart the exact same way your book even has a picture of it in chapter three it'll have a red ball and a yellow ball and they're both at the same height one of which is shot horizontal and the other one's dropped at the same instant. And they took a bunch of photos like every hundredth of a second and you'll see dink, dink, 
ding like that they fall exactly the same i just so remember it, go ahead i just remember the mythbusters episode uh where they shot a bullet and dropped the bullet at the same time ah uh, yeah and they yeah. both hit the ground at the same time yeah isn't that wild i mean if you can get rid of air resistance because that tends to make bullets lift and stuff like that but yeah if you drop a ball such that the bottom of the ball is the exact same height as the ball bottom of the bullet when it leaves the barrel and you drop it at the same time, technically the ball will hit the ground at the exact same time the bullet does. Uh, but the same thing works with Barney. It was so cool that we could actually do it with such a slow speed that Barney would be about this high above the ground, even though we dropped him from like eight feet high, he would still get hit that high above the ground because the, the bullet would go like this and then land. It was Velcro, it was a little ball with Velcro, so it stuck to him. So that's a neat little thing. And that's something you'll be able to prove uh, in the next chapter. So gravity acts on things uh, in such a way that it doesn't care the motion. For instance, if I throw a ball up at 10 meters per second, in exactly one second, ignoring air resistance, the velocity of that ball will be 0 0.20 meters per second because it takes away 9.8 meters per second every second. At the end of the next second, it's going to be traveling downward at 9.6 meters per second because it had to account for the additional 0.2 meters per second it had. And then at the next second, it's going to be 9.6 plus 9.8 or what? Uh, that's 19.4, something like that, meters per second downward. It doesn't matter. It's always going to change the velocity each second by nine meter, 9.8 meters per second. Or if you want it in feet, just to make it feel a little better, it's 32 feet per second. I think it's even 32.2 feet per second. So, all right. So that those are two of our kinematic equations. We've got more, okay? Uh, we've got, for instance, the very definition that uh, average acceleration is V minus V zero over T minus T zero which sometimes people will just write delta T or they'll just write T in the bottom. We also have V bar is equal to. Oh, yeah. Y'all want to y'all want to see what I'm writing or you just want me to just tell. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's me again. Sorry about that. Thanks for catching me. <laughs> but y'all want to look at what I'm writing. That might come in handy, huh? Oh, Lord. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, v is equal to uh, V, or excuse me, the average acceleration is equal to V minus V zero over T minus T zero. You can see that's essentially the same as the equation immediately above it, but it's also a definition of average acceleration. Similar, the average velocity is X minus X zero over T minus T zero. Again, we almost always call T zero just zero. So you could just cover up that T and call it V minus V zero over T or X minus X zero over T. But then there's that other definition where the acceleration is equal to DV DT, which also happens to be equal to D two X over DT squared. And V is actually equal to DX over DT. By the way, just in case you run into this, this is the same thing as X with a dot over it. And this is the same thing as X with two dots over it. So in your math classes, you're used to using a prime to indicate a derivative. That's a derivative with respect to X. In physics, we take a lot of derivatives with respect to time. Uh, and we're using Newton's notation on that, his system of fluxions, as he called it. And we just put a dot for a single derivative with respect to time and a double dot for a second derivative. Okay, so just be advised, I'm not going to use that in your class, but when you get to statics and dynamics, they may or may not use it. Now, with those definitions, of course, we were also able to come up with, if I took that V equals V0 plus AT, and solved it for t and plugged it in the x equals one half at uh, squared equation. I ended up getting v squared is equal to v zero squared plus two times the acceleration times x minus x zero. Again, that is a kinematic equation that's only true for constant acceleration. It turns out there's another one too. The average velocity 
is uh, V0 plus V1 over 2. Again, only for A equals a constant. Okay. And, and this, this could also be equal to, let's say, V1 plus V3 over 2. It doesn't matter if you just take two uh, velocities at two different times and divide it by two. That'll be the average velocity between those two uh, time periods. Okay. So those are our kinematic equations for those very special circumstances. Uh, let's answer a question, though. So we've got, it's uh, 6.07, we got till uh, 6.40. So let's do a problem. I'm going to change my marker to black for a second. And I'm going to say a... Mm, no, I won't do that. Alex Morgan leaps straight up at uh, let's say 4.00 meters per second. A, how high will she reach? B, how long will she be in the air? In other words, what's her hang time? And C, how fast oh, will she be going when she lands? So just the, the instant before she hits the ground, how fast will she be going? So those are some pretty nice, typical kinematic questions, okay? Now, one thing you got to do, and this is, this is a major part of physics, is you read a physics problem and you've got to uh, sort of act like a starving dog and suck the very last bit of marrow out of the bone that you happen to find in the ditch in the swamp or something. So you've got to read the problem and not only get all the information they're directly telling you, like I told you she jumped up at four meters per second, but you've got to sift out all the other information they're telling you. So for instance, in this case, they didn't say anything about her being on a foreign planet or in a space station. So I'm going to assume she's on planet Earth, which means she's suffering uh, a gravitational field that pulls her towards the center of the Earth with an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second every second. That's one thing that was implied. If I had, I had asked you to solve a problem where someone dropped a ball, then they, uh, they inferred, or excuse me, they implied, and you need to infer that the initial velocity was zero because they dropped it, and that the acceleration was towards the ground and happened to be 9.8 meters per second every second. So even though that wasn't said, you got to figure that out. Not only that, you got to figure out what are the things they gave me and what symbols did we use for those in our class. So first off, I know that the initial velocity, and I'm going to use this convention, by the way, My convention is going to be, and you might see this in your engineering classes as well, uh, basically they, they won't put the X or the Y there. They'll just write that with a circle and they'll put a plus in it. Uh, we're not doing any rotation, so I didn't need to draw that part, but that's a, a typical thing you'll see in an engineering class. And what it means is, hey, 
I'm going to say to the right is positive, up is positive, and anything that causes a counterclockwise torque is going to be positive. So that's what I'm doing here. And because of that, I now know that V0, the initial velocity, and in fact, that's in the Y direction, so I'm going to put a Y on it just to remind us, that's going to be 4.00 meters per second. Now that I've called upward the positive direction, that also tells me that the acceleration is going to be negative G, which is negative 9.80 meters per second every second. Okay. Now for part A, they're asking how high will she reach? So I'm looking for Y max equals question mark. Can anybody tell me any details about Alex's motion when she reaches her max height? Her velocity will be zero. Excellent. So Y max is equal to, I wrote zero there. I meant the right question mark. Okay. Uh, but it happens when V sub Y is equal to zero. So that's, again, something else that you, uh, that was implied by the problem and you, of course, inferred it. That's, that's good physics. That's what you got to do. Part B, it asks, how long will she be in the air? So what I want to know is T total. And that means going from V initial equals 4.0. No, let's not do it that way. Erase, turn you. You mean velocity zero when she's at that max height? Is that what that means? That's what that meant on the A part. On the B part, what I, what I meant was Y is equal to zero the second time. Okay, and then part C, uh, how fast will she be going? So for part C, I don't know why I wrote B, I must have had a stroke just then. Okay, uh, that is uh, V final equals question mark at Y equals zero. So that's another piece of information I sort of inferred is that obviously when I get back to that height of zero, that's the velocity that she'll have and hopefully I'll be able to solve it. So for part A, what we know is VY is equal to zero. I could immediately use, for instance, let's call this equation one. Let's call this equation two. Let's call this equation three. This equation four. Uh, let's call this equation five. This equation six. Let's call this equation seven, eight, nine, and 10, just for the heck of it. Uh, I'm not gonna stick with that the whole semester or anything. But what I can see is if I choose to use equation three, I can figure out part A. So A, I'm going to use number three. At the top of the arc now, because we want to find out what her Y max is, her final velocity will be zero. So I'm going to put zero squared is equal to 4.00 meters per second squared plus two times negative 9.80 meters per second every second. And this time I'm gonna say Y max minus zero because I'm calling Y zero or what the equation said was X zero. I'm assuming she started at the origin. Does that make sense? So this allows me to find that Y max turns out to be uh, 16.00. Uh, actually, I guess that has to be 16 point, just plain zero meters squared per second squared divided by 19.6 meters per second per second. 
notice by setting that equal to zero, the negative could become positive at getting it on the other side. So I'm going to take 16 and divide it by 19.6. Wait, sorry. What did you do to get Y max on the left side? Okay, so I'm using uh, this part right here. Let me let me show it to you with another color. I'm using this part right here with that green, and I'm choosing to make x zero equal to y zero, but I'm calling it zero, and I'm choosing to change x to just plain y because it's in the vertical direction. So why not? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to do four squared, and then I'm going to divide that by 19.6. And that gives me 0 0.816. And notice the units work out to meters. I wrote it in green because that's what I have. So Notice the meters per second per second is the same thing as meters per second squared. And since it's in the denominator, you'll flip it over. The seconds of squared will be on the top, canceling out the second squared on the bottom from the numerator. And only one of the meters will disappear. So that's why I got meters as my final answer. Part B, I want to know the total time. And students often try to avoid equation two, like the plague. And you can probably imagine why. Uh, namely, it looks like you might have to use a quadratic formula, but in this case, it's super, super easy. Yeah, Taylor, go ahead. Um, for part A, couldn't we, could we also solve that with equation number one? If we uh, substituted V for zero, uh, V naught for four, and then plugged in the acceleration and solved for T? Ah, so yes, if you, are you saying zero? And then so doubled it. Velocity? It would, and then doubled it because, um, it would take the same amount of time to go down as it did to go up. Exactly. That's the symmetry of the motion. And that works as long as you're leaving and landing at the same height. We will do problems where you launch, say, from a cliff and land in a ravine or where you launch from a ravine and land in a cliff. So you can't do that. But yeah, absolutely right. You can do it that way. Uh, you could set V uh, equal to zero with V zero equal to four. And that could actually give you the time it requires to reach zero velocity and just multiply that by two. That would give you the hang time. So that would answer uh, question uh, B. And then you could use that to answer question C. The big thing you try to do, though, in physics is you try to use as few of the numbers you calculated as possible. So like, ideally, I'd like to do the rest of these problems without using that 0.816, because if I made a mistake getting that 0.816, all my problems are going to be a mistake, and uh, the instructor not, might not pay close enough attention to realize I actually did parts B, C, D, and E correctly, but because I did part A wrong, it got all of them wrong. So always keep that in mind. It's almost not a problem when we do multiple choice tests, which is what I'm doing, but that's something to keep in mind. All right, for part B, it wants to know how long will she be in the air? This is where you could, for instance, use that double. I'm not going to do that. I, I, that's a physical interpretation that's good, and that's good conceptual physics, but I'm going to show you brute force. It works okay, too. I'm going to use equation two, and I know as far as equation two goes, uh, when she lands and when she takes off, her position will be zero. So I'm going to write zero is equal to one half negative 9.8 zero. I'll leave the units off for, for space reasons. T squared plus 4.00 T plus zero. Now you see why it's not a big deal because not all terms have a T in it. So I really just get zero is equal to negative 19.6. Professor, are you writing this down? Yes. Um, I can't see it. Is it, I think the, it might Let be the this way. I'll make it a little bigger so you can see it. Is that better now? Yes, mm -hmm. okay. thank you. 
No problem. So I'm writing that uh, one half of 9.8, I almost wrote 19.6, is negative four, whoa, is negative 4.90t. I'm going to put a parenthesis around this. You'll see why. Plus 4.00 times t. Uh, now what you see is two numbers, t and then that parenthetical expression, uh, multiplied by each other equals zero. And the only way that can be true is either t has to equal zero, which duh, that's the instance you jump, or the other one has to be zero. So I will choose the other one. And the other one is in fact, t is equal to uh, 4.00 divided by 4.90. And the units do work out, but four divided by 4.9 gives me 0. Point, oh, that's some crappy hang time. Did I do it right? Four divided by 4.9, yeah. Zero, oh, I was misreading it. 0. 0.816. Seconds. And that's her hang time. That's how long she's in the air. But notice that it's neat enough that you get t equals zero is another choice. So the equations are smart enough to know that, oh, yeah, it's also going to be zero at t equals zero. So that's kind of cool. Now, the last part is how fast will she be going? And uh, this is a case where you can use that time that you just found the 0.816 and you can use equation one and that would be fine. Or you can use equation three, check this out. If you use equation three, y final is zero, y zero is zero. So the whole 2a parentheses y minus y zero is zero, and you can tell that v has got to equal v zero. So I will put this over here in, in different color. Let's say I will use green, and I'll say that part c, v squared is equal to v zero squared plus two times negative 9.8 times zero minus zero means V is equal to 4.00 meters per second. And remember, you actually have to take the uh, plus or minus square root. In this case, we have to choose the minus because she will actually be going in the down direction. So that's sort of a quick and dirty way to do it. If you wanted to, you could totally put in V0 is 4, A is negative 9.8, and T is 0.816. I'd carry one extra digit, which is 3. So when I do 9.8 times 0.8163, and then I, uh, I subtract that from when I subtract that from three from four, I get negative four point zero zero meters per second again. So that also gives it to me. Any questions on that? Okay. Well, I did put, let me stop sharing for a second. Uh, and let me start sharing this for a second right here. I did put a buttload of videos up, not only on my YouTube channel, but on Canvas itself. Uh, I want you to notice, of course, these were still dealing with chapters one and chapter two. So in the modules, if you go down, you'll see all these are new problems I put up. Uh, highest and lowest, this is a, a unit conversion. This is another unit conversion. This is another unit conversion. Uh, this is teaching you what a leader is. This is some stuff that'll help you with lab uh, in case you're not getting all the stuff that your lab instructor is getting you. Uh, but if you go down to week two, not that one, but this one, 
Uh, I don't know why, why that one's even showing. You'll see I have an introduction to kinematics, kinematics, continued relative velocity and free fall. I have kinematics for an aircraft carrier, a 737, a FA-18. Uh, I have a problem where a police car turns around and chases a speeder. Uh, there's actually even more than that. I can, for instance, let's do this. I'm going to pull up my YouTube channel. And you can see all these are, are ones that I've done recently. That's for 242. Notice when you when you click on them, if you see down here something that says 242, then, then that's not for your course. If you don't see something like that, then it's probably okay. This one, notice it's only about, well, this was actually an hour and 24 minutes. So this is actually a, a long problem. And it is actually going to be, here, let me do show more. It will be for physics 242. But you can also do a search by video if you wanted to by searching in here and you can look for various problems. Uh, just by doing a search for like kinematics. And you'll find a buttload of problems. Introduction to kinematics, position, velocity, accelerator. You'll notice some of them are really long. They're like hours. That stuff's there literally like a whole class like you just finished taking. But then some are kind of short, not nearly as many, though. 41, that's actually a class as well. That's a class as well. But some of them are kind of short, and that's just me solving problems. Like, here's a projectile motion problem uh, where you fired the projectile downward. That's good for Chapter 3. Uh, here's for a lab, stuff like that. So you can find all these in here. There's one in here that I do for calculating the actual acceleration of the Tesla Plaid the, that I told you goes from zero to 60 in 1.9 seconds. Uh, notice this is what I was talking about. See that 241? That means, hey, this is from a class just like yours. So it's fair game. Obviously, someone was on an aircraft, uh, but and this one's kind of long, so that's a whole class, uh, so on and so forth. So you can always find that stuff. I just want to remind you it's there, uh, and I've got to put some more stuff up there. I'm thinking I haven't put all the stuff for 241 up there. I've put it in the day class, but not in the night class. So let me show you what the day class has, because the night class will have it uh, probably tonight or tomorrow. So if you look at this is slight, this is actually exactly the same as the one I just showed you, but this one you can see is a little bit different. I got a, a couple more problems in there and so on and so forth. So those will pop up here. One thing I wanted to remind you about is uh, Canvas doesn't behave that nicely with YouTube. If I click on this YouTube link, it opens a window and then it does that. All you have to do is either click on that see that little box with the arrow or click on that and it'll take you to a whole another window and then that'll pop up there are ways you can slow it down speed it up all sorts of cool stuff in here uh actually it's not there i don't remember where it is now but you can also pause it at any time and uh pick back up it has the ability to even do closed caption that sort of thing so as you can tell, I put zero editing into it. So sometimes there'll be, you know, two minutes of my bald head just, just, you know, sitting there in front of the camera. So I apologize for that in advance, but that's just, uh, it's a lot easier to get the stuff up real quick without trying to edit it. Maybe I'll edit it more in the future. So anybody have any other questions? So using the, uh, going back to the C part of that question, mm -hmm. um, using the V squared mm -hmm. equation, you just added the negative because you knew that she was on her way down. Oh, okay. So in that case, I had chosen up as positive. That's why I drew that little up arrow, right arrow, and then put a little plus symbol in there. Mm -hmm. So I'm automatically calling up positive. So her initial velocity would have been up, so I'd call that positive four. The acceleration is actually causing things to speed up going down, so I'd call that uh, negative since it's going down. 
but it ended up not mattering because I ended up multiplying that two times negative 9.8 times just zero because her initial and final heights were both zero. Yeah, so, so I, I, I did do it um, with the other other equation too, the V equals uh, V naught plus acceleration times time. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. And, uh, that, that works out as it gives you the negative. But with the other exactly. one, you just had to know that she was yep. moving in a negative direction. Okay. That's why a lot of physics instructors don't allow you to use the V squared equals V zero squared plus two AX because you've got to use your physical intuition to decide on whether you want a positive or a negative square root in that case i forced the negative because i knew she'd be going down that and makes do you, sense yes do you want us to show some type of a symbol like what you showed uh with the graph indicating how we're going to cause up and down or call um, up and down that that helps so uh most of my tests because i have so many students most of my tests are going to be uh multiple choice Sometimes, like on a midterm or a final, I'll have something where you have 15 minutes uh, after you submit your test to email me a PDF copy of your work, and then I can give you partial credit. That's when you when you have to show me your work. Uh, but other than that, I, I hardly ever get to see your work at all. I just get to see whether you got the right answer or not. Okay, so if I just say, because I like to list out the known variables mm -hmm. um, first. If I just say acceleration is negative 9.8, well, you just accept that to know that. Yeah, okay, yeah, absolutely. Down is a and negative direction and I don't have to draw that symbol. Yeah, exactly, you don't have to. It just like I said, if, if it's something like when we get in the three dimensions, you'll need somewhere to have a diagram because I'll need to have some sense of what angle you're doing if you calculate the final velocity which means magnitude and direction, and you sell me 30 degrees, I need to know 30 degrees from what? You might say, uh, uh, you might say 30 degrees north of east, then I'll get it. Or you might have to draw an XY coordinate system and, and draw 30 degrees up from the positive X. That's fine too. Uh, also, don't get in the rut of always assuming uh, down is negative. For instance, one of the problems I just mentioned to you on my YouTube channel was me throwing a ball downward from a cliff. Negatives are a pain in the butt when you're dealing with them arithm arithmetically as well as algebraically. You just accidentally lose them sometimes. So if I was solving such a problem where I threw a ball downward from a cliff, I would say down is going to be the positive direction, in which case my initial velocity would be positive, my acceleration would be positive, and I wouldn't have to touch any negatives. So don't don't always just assume you're going to call up positive and down negative. Sometimes there's a very good reason to make down uh, the positive direction. Okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, really, guys, what you, what you need to do is see a lot of problems being worked, which is, you know, your book gives you, oddly enough, it, it really gives you enough examples. Uh, but in addition to that, you can look on Khan Academy, you can look on my YouTube channel. But the main thing is not that you've seen a bunch of problems, but that you've seen enough that now you can solve problems. So try not to get in that rut. It's very easy. I've only had one student I've known that's been really uh disciplined enough to do this this was a student i only got to see once a week because she lived literally in hatteras and she would drive from hatteras to manio to meet me once a week for calculus based physics and i was driving from elizabeth city all the way to manio and uh it was such a long drive for her. i said well you you know as long as you feel comfortable you can only meet you can meet me once a week and that'll be good enough and you know we'll t handle the test that way and she had a long time between. So I said, well, here's the, the solutions manual. I know you're disciplined. I know you're working your work. So take the solutions manual with you in case you run into any problems. And two weeks later, she gave me the problem back. She said, no, I'm using it too much. And I, I can tell I can't solve problems. And she gave it back to me. You guys want to try, and, and I probably would not have done that either, uh, just to, to put the record straight. I probably would not have been disciplined enough to do that. But you guys want to be at that level of discipline where you realize I'm leaning too much on looking stuff up or I'm leaning too much on uh, looking at similar examples. 
so that you can do well on the midterm. So really try to practice that. If you get to the point where you can consistently take a practice test and maybe every other test or maybe every other other test, you have to look something up, then you're probably in a pretty good spot. If you have to look up something every test, you're, you probably haven't gotten enough experience yet. You need more problems. Uh, my goal every chapter was to try to solve all of the odd problems in the end of the book, at uh, the end of the chapter. The end of the chapter normally had anywhere from 100 to 140 problems. So you can imagine my goal was to solve between 50 and 70 problems per chapter. Uh, I was planning on being a physics major, though. You guys are not necessarily, but I will promise you if you're going into mechanical, our structural engineering, our civil engineering, our aerodynamics, uh, aeronautical engineering, uh, electrical engineering, all of those, you need to do that many physics problems. So just, you know, be careful. If you're just going for like biology or just chemistry, there's a whole other set of things you need to do. Uh, but so just, just try to keep that in mind. Uh, anybody else have any questions? So do try to uh, subscribe again. And I don't mind you uh, unsubscribing when the class is over. That's fine. But if you subscribe to my YouTube channel now, every time I post something, if you set the settings right, it'll let you know, hey, Mr. Younger posted something. And I'm getting ready to post a buttload of stuff. So you'll, you'll get to see a lot of different videos that'll help you. Uh, I'll be doing those for 241. I think I've got four more left for 241. And then I got about eight left for 242. I'm hoping I can knock all those out tomorrow. So have a good one. Uh, you guys are free to go. I'll wait for the last person to leave. Uh, I'm looking at a comment right now. Is there a way you can pull up a sample problem that you haven't made up? Uh, yes. Is there a way you can pull up a sample problem? That you, yeah, what I would do in that case, let me do share screen real quick. Someone asked for a sample problem that wasn't one I made up. Uh, a sample problem that wasn't one I made up would be probably one of these from the textbook. And you'd see stuff like a stone dropped from the top of a cliff. It is seen to hit the ground below after 3.5, uh, 3.25 seconds. How tall is the cliff? That's a really low level problem. When you first jump into a section, like in this case, section 27, the first couple problems are really low level and are supposed to be easy. And they're usually indicated by an I. As they get more complicated, they're listed with a double I, so I, I a ball player catches a ball 2.6 seconds after throwing it vertically upward. With what speed did he throw it and what height did it reach? That's another good one. Uh, there's one here. I like this one, a stone thrown vertically. Uh, they're asking you stuff about, you know, how fast it'd be going, but he literally threw a stone by the edge of a cliff. He threw it up at 15.5 meters per second. It went up to some max height and then passed by him and fell all the way down to 75 meters below. That's another good problem. Uh, one that I have frequently got my students to do is this number 69 here. It says a falling stone, notice it's a level three problem. A falling stone takes 0.28 seconds to travel past a window 2.2 meters tall. From what height above the top of the window did the stone fall? I love that problem. It's really great. One thing to give you a little hint on how to solve that is guess what? If you divide 2.2 meters by 0.28 seconds, that's an average velocity. Okay. That's the average velocity that it had. Now you realize for a given height above the building, uh, above this window, the top of the window is going to be lined up with the ball or rock having a very specific speed based on how high it is. And then 0.28 seconds later, it's going to have a speed of 0.28 times 9.8 velocity higher. So you now know that this velocity is 0.28 times 9.8 faster than this velocity and you can then work it backwards to figure out how high it is. So that's just one of the neat little tricks. Uh, and I'm planning on solving something sort of like that on the YouTube channel. That's one of the uh, problems I've got written up. So anybody else?
So are the tests in lockdown? So no, when you do the online test, that's open notes, open book, open other books, open other people's notes, and you can even do Google searches. The only thing I ask you is you're not supposed to be interacting with other people. So you shouldn't be interacting with someone who's already seen the test, for instance, and you shouldn't be looking at websites that were created uh, after I posted the test online, because obviously then someone could take the test and then make an exact replica of it out of their memory and make a website out of it. And then you could look at that. Those are not allowed. That's the only thing I'm trying to get you to avoid is getting a, either real time help or help from someone who's seen the test. But I'm completely cool with you trying to get as high a grade as possible. You'll see the online tests are not. I think they're only worth like 10 percent. So that's what that's for. The practice test and the test will be in a separate little module above week one. It'll say practice test. That'll be one module and that's where all your practice tests will be. And then there'll be an online test module and that's where your online tests will be. And we, where will, will we access those tests? It will be from um, uh, Canvas. From, uh, Okay, from Canvas. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting ready to pull that window up right quick just to show you. So I'm clicking back on modules. So right here it says helpful drop area. That's just a hidden thing I put there. But literally right here there will be a box and it'll say practice tests. And then there'll be a box below that and it'll say online tests. And the practice test will be here and the online test will be there. And actually that's a different class, but <laughs> same thing is that's my day class, but yeah, it's the same thing. Anybody else? Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for coming everybody. I know this isn't easy. I appreciate your, your skill and your hard work and trying to take this class on an online scenario. I know it's not easy. Please try to make use of my help. If you have any difficulties, make sure you let me know. Uh, if you're trying to do a problem on your homework or on your uh, practice tests in Canvas, uh, take a screenshot of the problem with the actual answer choices and uh, send it to me and try to articulate as best you can what difficulties you're having. And then I'll do my best to make sure I either answer you or put out a blanket announcement to answer it for everybody. We can all succeed. We can all make really good oh. grades and I'll be here for you. I have a question. Go for it. Earlier when you were doing the acceleration of one question, um, I noticed that you went from 2t squared when you did the derivative. How did you get from 2t squared to 0 0.667 repeating ah. and t cubed? Because uh, the next integral it was 2t squared, and when you take the integral of 2t squared, you get one-third times 2t cubed. So 2 divided by 3 is 0. 0.666. Remember the weird thing about the... Oh, that uh, makes sense now. It's, yeah. It's like multiplying it with a fraction of the underneath, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, Thank remember you. when you're doing integrals, the new exponent goes in the bottom, whereas, whereas you're doing derivatives, the old exponent goes on the top. Anything else, anybody? So how long will the practice test be open again? Uh, I usually keep it open somewhere between three days and a week but I always make sure I have at least a Friday, Saturday, and a Sunday available. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Oh, no well, problem. will we know like uh, the deadline for that when it does get posted? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, basically, almost certainly the deadline will be 11.59 on a Sunday night. Uh, someone also asked about the uh, physics primer. For some reason, it keeps popping up where there's two versions you only have to take one, and the one you're supposed to take is the one that has the most points allotted to it. So if you see one, it's worth 66 points, and another one's worth 118. You're supposed to take the 118, 
that doesn't mean you need to retake it. What I'm going to do is I, it, it's my fault. So I got to deal with it. I will look at your, if you did two of them, I will look at the higher score and I will put that in the one that I keep and I'll throw the other one away. So don't worry too much about that. It is extra credit anyways, those two. So it's not that big a deal, but I definitely want you to do them. I just give them to you as, as extra credit because they're kind of a pain. But if you don't do them, mastering in my lab and mastering is a lot more complicated without doing them first. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Did you hear that, Christian? Hopefully you can- Could you repeat that, that again? The last section? Yeah, okay, so there's a uh, physics primer and there's an intro to my lab and mastering in the homework sets. And I think they were due, I, I thought they were due this past Sunday, but they might be due a little later. Uh, they're purely extra credit. If you didn't do them, that's fine. But I really think you should do them, whether they're whether you get points for it or not, just because it makes you better at doing my lab and mastering work. Uh, but for some reason, there's two of each. What you're supposed to do is of the two, the one that has the most points, that's the one you're supposed to do. But it doesn't matter if you did the wrong one. I'm going to put the, the score in the right one and throw away the other one. So you don't have to do anything special. You just, if you haven't done it yet, try to do the one with the bigger points, with the most points. Anyone else? All right, I guess I'll call it a day, folks. Uh, Last call. All right. Haley, nothing. Christian, nothing. No question. I was just listening to the other people's questions. <laughs> no problem. If, if you guys, like I said, if you email me and you don't get a response within one school day, as, as explained in the syllabus, make sure you go ahead and text me and include your first and last name and that you're in Physics 241 night or Physics 241 N01B. Uh, so I'll know who you are and, and I'll address you that way. So just, you know, make sure you don't go without getting your questions answered. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. See you, Haley. See you, Christian. Bye-bye.